The year is 1999. The world is in crisis as humanity is under threat from the Y2K bug. But in the town of Horsham in the United Kingdom, an obscure company called the Creative Assembly was heedlessly working on their most ambitious project yet. Developing a video game combining strategic decision making on a campaign map similar to the Civilization series and real-time battles somewhat akin to the gameplay of Age of Empires and Starcraft. It was the launch of a gaming franchise that sought to ask questions others were too afraid to. Was Alexander the Great a good commander? Will gunpowder change the face of warfare? And if Napoleon was such a great general, then why is he dead? The game was Shogun Total War. To become Shogun will require battles to be won with the mind as well as the sword. Now is your time. Let Total War begin. Released in June 2000 as the world was reeling from the apocalypse, it was a resounding financial success for the company, but more importantly its gameplay was like nothing seen before in the wider strategy genre. Whereas combat in civilization was decided by auto-resolving in a turn-based environment, Shogun transported you to a battlefield where you would command your armies in real time. But it was still very different from other RTS titles. Combat in Age of Empires makes use of a more traditional hit point system. A unit will keep on fighting until its health bar is fully depleted. Shogun Total War did away with this traditional HP system, instead opting for a morale system, which simulates a unit's willingness to keep on fighting. Morale would receive changes throughout the Total War titles, but generally speaking it functioned intuitively. A unit that was attacked in the rear by cavalry will see its morale plummet while a unit will have its morale boosted if its general is nearby, to name some examples. When a unit's morale fell too low, it would stop fighting and attempt to flee from battle. This mechanic added a lot of tactical and strategic depth to encounters, rewarding resourceful players by allowing them to effectively adopt strategies such as defeat in detail and take advantage of force multipliers. Being able to strike at a wavering enemy unit led to a domino effect, as other units would begin to waver and rout as their flanks were exposed and their friends were routing. The other design element separating Total War from its RTS competitors was the way entities behaved. You don't command individual soldiers. Okay, well, we'll get to that. A unit isn't an individual entity, but tens or hundreds of soldiers. A natural result of this design was that a unit's killing power would decrease as it took casualties which when combined with the morale system made for a unique formula that set the series apart from its rivals. That the first entry achieved this left CA with a solid foundation to build on with sequels. Okay, I lost a province. Command the attack personally. Yeah, of course I'm gonna command it personally. I'm, I'm curious to see. Oh, whoa, whoa. Okay, now, now it's functioning somewhat properly. Oh my god. Where's my army? I, I can't fast travel on this map over here. Oh boy, this the yeah, this this interface is not good. Not good. Where's my army? Oh, there's a kill ratio. Oh, that's interesting. I wish I wish Shogun 2 had that. I wish later games had that the kill ratio rather than I just having to calculate it. That's a, that's a neat bit of information that would be nice to see. Like, uh, you know, some sometimes numbers can be useful. Fine day. Why, of course I'll. Okay, so that's that's weird. That that first screen is kind of useless, but okay. Yeah, they they were very clear. You can tell this is this is somebody's first attempt at doing a game like this. But hey, and I don't even have any general. It's not that great. I have two archers, two samurai archers. This is an age of darkness. Medieval Total War followed just over a year later in 2002, featuring battles with up to 10,000 soldiers and introducing siege battles, which have featured in every game since. It was overall more of a refinement over its predecessor, and unfortunately the novelty of sieges soon gave way to frustration at unit pathfinding. So I cannot place units on the walls. Okay, that's interesting. I guess. 
<laughs> well, at least the AI pathfinding is kind of off. Clearly very, very off. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. I, I wonder what would cause the AI to make it. What is this decision making? I don't know. Are they just going to sit here and stare at me or something? Slow rate of fire. Oh, they are doing a counter march. They are actually doing a counter march. Hang on. Let me see it. Let me see it. Yep, we have some more firing drills. This is awesome. Awesome. Awesome firing drills. What are these units even doing? It was clear that the engine was showing its limitations fire. because the next game in the series would do away with it. Introducing Rome Total War, which was arguably as revolutionary as the original Shogun. Total War featured a 3D campaign map now, adding substantial depth to the strategic element as players now had more control over army placements. The battles were also now fully 3D, instead of using sprites as in the earlier titles. Having the soldiers modeled in three dimensions was more than just an aesthetic change. The game could now more accurately simulate the effects of mass in battle, making formations more dynamic and less reliant on static modifiers. The attention to detail was astonishing. For example, shields were properly modeled in games such that units would take varying degrees of damage from arrow fire depending on where they were being shot from. Everything from the orientation of the unit to its movement path had some effect on the gameplay, and all were capable of being leveraged by the player. Unhappy overtaking casualties? All right. Meanwhile, let's let's check let's check out how these guys are doing with Testudo over here. If these guys on the side haven't really taken any casualties. Oh wow, they have been. This this AI. This was the to, this was the the Total War AI in 2004. All of these missile units are firing on the one exposed Testudo unit. They're not even they're not even attempting to fire on these units that are facing in the correct direction. They're only firing on this unit. The level of simulation was groundbreaking at the time, and is something that even many modern strategy games fail to implement. And it combined with Total War's morale system to make for gameplay that would reliably reward players for their resourcefulness and proper understanding of their unit's characteristics. Let's see if we can get some units to break over here. Look at how... Look at how... Look at how quickly... Look at how quickly this entire army routed. Look at... And these aren't... These these aren't... And, and these and these aren't even bad units. These are not... These are not low quality units. Th those are not low quality units that the, that the Carthaginians have. Those are pretty decent units. And look at how quickly they melted. Look at... No, no. I want to watch him swim. I want to watch some, some peasants swim. Or archers swim, sorry. Not peasants. Oh, look at that. Look at that, guys. Look at that. Look at that. We have... We have some very, very... Capable athletes on our team. Imagine, imagine having this for light infantry units in other games. Like, all the depth that could add to the game. That the light infantry have this specific property. And even the AI can use it. It's not like it's something that the AI never uses. So the AI that can't even use... The, the AI that can't even use loose formation in Shogun 2 can do this in this game. It's, it is just amazing. It is so weird seeing this. And then some of them are walking on the shallow terrain. Others are swimming. So it's not like all of the men are forced to swim. It's, it's like it shows you just how much thought went into this. This isn't just... This isn't just a feature that they tacked on because they could. This is something that actually they, they thought and they implemented and it works well. It, it works well. Rome Total War was not without its issues though. Even by the standards of its time, the game's battle interface was clunky and unresponsive. There was a significant delay for mouse drag commands, which was especially detrimental in the middle of larger scale battles, as inputs would often be swallowed if done too quickly. The battle camera would also be made much faster and smoother in later titles. Guys, wow. Wow, look at look at how Look at look at look, I'm actually clicking over here and it's not registering. If I if I if I was the, this was Shogun 2, it would be it would be registering every single time, almost every single time. 
They they were still clearly learning at this time. And then and then you wanna you wanna do the same thing over here if you wanna do a drag. If you wanna drag the unit, look at look at look at look at how poorly it registers. You have to hold for like two seconds. You have to hold and play the game extremely slowly. And this is something they didn't even they didn't even fix this in the remaster. In the remaster, 20, not 20 years, 15 years later, they, they didn't even bother to fix that. The, literally the most basic thing. The one thing that could have massively improved the game, that could have been a legit improvement, is they, they didn't even bother to tackle that. But okay. The transition to 3D also exposed limitations with the AI, which had questionable army management on the campaign map. The diplomacy AI wasn't very good either with allies often being unreliable and with the potential for the player to expand by buying lands from other factions. They must have had a few naval patches uh, since the launch version. Like, not only is the massive fleet started around randomly, but also then there's tiny fleets surrounding them in like certain corners of the map. It's so weird. Why are they pumping so much money into navies? And yeah, the Skippy Eye, they're not doing anything, as usual. Look, an Egyptian fleet up here, a Greek fleet up here. They're all getting stuck in the corners. <laughs> it's so weird. If Rome was a major leap for the franchise, its sequel, Medieval 2, would be a more of a skip and a hop. Total War now revisited this period of history with all the advancements made in Rome, combining that game's developments with papal mechanics, crusades, and jihads, as well as early gunpowder weapons and artillery during the later stages of the campaign. Battles were just as robust, continuing the emphasis on simulation. Though there were notable balance issues in the base game, such as the finickiness of pike infantry, who would often break formation and switch to their sidearms, and the general lack of reliable anti-cavalry units. The Kingdom's expansion for Medieval 2, featuring campaigns ranging from the New World to Northern Europe to the Middle East, buffed spear infantry, somewhat curbing the effectiveness of cavalry. Medieval 2 also unfortunately inherited Rome's issues without attempting to fix them. The battle interface was still unresponsive, and the diplomacy AI was still quite schizophrenic. We can't discuss Medieval 2 without bringing up the game's substantial modding scene. In 2010, the Third Age mod brought Total War into the Lord of the Rings universe, with a lore-accurate map and unit roster that when combined with the robustness of the gameplay made the mod as much as a selling point as the vanilla game, if not more so. The game was made available on Steam only in 2012, six years following its release, so we don't have any data on player numbers prior to that. But we do know that over the years the game has steadily gained popularity, reaching an all-time peak of over 8,000 concurrent players in March of 2020, nearly 15 years after its initial release. By 2008, Total War had had four resoundingly successful entries, along with several robust expansions, and a new game was on the horizon. Using a new engine, and set during the 18th century with a focus on the Enlightenment, the American Revolution, and line infantry warfare, Empire Total War was looking to revolutionize the series' gameplay, in a manner similar to the transition from the first medieval game to Rome. For the first time in franchise history, naval battles could be played in real time, featuring sail-propelled ships of the line that could use differing forms of ammunition and perform boarding attacks. The campaign map would encompass the Americas, Europe, North Africa, the Middle East, and India. Topping this off was a pretty neat trailer showcasing the turmoil of the late 18th century. Wait, uh, are they firing into the wall? I want to see. I want to see over here if they're firing into the wall. I want to see if they're firing into the wall because I know like this game's uh, line of sight isn't too intelligent. Yep, they are firing into the wall over there. Yeah, I caught that on camera. I, it kind of defeats the purpose of having like somewhat of having fire at will, like just having it exist if they're. If they're just gonna waste ammunition firing like the whole point of fire at will is they just fire whenever i didn't realize i had to, i had a bunch of cavalry units outside is that they fire whenever they have a target presented to them you know provided the target is within sight and they can actually shoot them i want to i want to stress i want to try and stress the pathfinding 
Oh, wow. 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 Whoa. Whoa. Look at him. Look at him go. Look at him go. Look at him go. Oh, my God. And I thought, I thought the pathfinding in, in Shogun 2 Sieges was kind of iffy. This is even worse. Did they, did they break? They didn't break down this uh, wall. Uh, how many Turks does it, ter does it take to climb a wall? There's a fucking ramp over there, guys. You ain't gonna respond to my orders, are you? I mean, the AI, the AI isn't really... Um, isn't faring much better. So we, we managed to catch them firing into walls and not knowing which way the enemy is, I'm guessing. And this unit, this unit over here has used up half its ammunition firing directly into the wall. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so the game wasn't released in a good state to put it lightly. The campaign AI was inept at moving armies and building balanced army compositions and diplomacy was worse than ever with the AI regularly refusing offers even if they were wholly in its favor, and declaring war on the player for no other reason than fuck them. The situation only got worse in battles. Not only was the AI so incompetent that it could barely even fight in formation, your own units handled terribly. Ordering a unit of line infantry to fire on a unit only slightly to its right or left would cause them to wheel their whole formation about, which as you can imagine takes a whole lot of time, and time is everything in a real-time tactics game. Yeah, look at them wheel around. Look at them wheel around. They were in range. They were in range. They could have fired over there. They could have just turned to their... And look, look, look at what that is doing. I know I know that archers, archers in Rome 1 wouldn't wheel around. They, the men would just turn, would just pivot around. So if they were facing in that direction, they would turn and fire in that direction lengthwise. So there you go, the way the, the unit control was just not properly, like, was not... They, they improved the interface, but... Uh, they, they had some work to do with the way units behaved, like, dynamically behaved, to, you know, to react to taking casualties and all that crap. Musketeers would also attempt firing at targets they couldn't see, their bullets harmlessly striking the crest of a hill in front of them. The game featured firing drills that you could research, and while they were great on paper, they responded terribly to taking casualties, often refusing to fire as men shuffled about to fill in the gaps left by their fallen comrades. Perhaps this was a balance feature, since drills like fire by rank greatly increased the firepower of your units, but considering the overall state of the game, that isn't easy to believe. more units come in. I want one unit to use fire by advance, uh, fire in advance. Yeah, come on, come on, guys. Do your thing, do your thing. Platoon fire. Yeah, here it is. Look, this game, this game had actual potential. Look at this. This is just amazing. Actual firing drills. Actual, well thought out firing drills. Look at that, look at that. Now the now the, the fire is traveling across the whole rank. You're gonna you're gonna fire in advance? Fire in advance. I wanna see fire in advance. Come on, come on. Fire in advance. A bit sluggish, but okay. Yeah, look at that, look at that. Look at that. With a uh, square, I want to see the time difference in forming square. I'm going to have one unit. I want to see like worst case scenario. I'm going to have one unit in about six. Yeah, that's six ranks versus a one unit that's completely stretched out. Just to like show like in the in like the, the most. <clears throat> in the most exaggerated comparison over here, and I'm going to tell them to both go into square. So they're both formed up over here and let's go. 
yeah that that was look at look at how much more quickly look at how much more quickly that unit formed square compared to this one and then and then square formation it is so interesting it adds such an interesting dynamic to the gameplay it provides it provides it provide it provides defense against cavalry but it also reduces the frontage for it, it reduces the frontage for your men on every side but they can fire in either in like any direction so what you can do is you know if you're in a multiplayer battle like what frequently people try to do is with cavalry they try to they they, they send their cavalry in in uh, feigned attacks and feigned maneuvers to try and get other people to form square because when you form square you're uh, the way it is it's you're trading you're trading um <clears throat> You're you're trading your ability to win a firefight with for protection against cavalry. So you're you, you if if you do get caught up in a firefight and you're in square, you're probably gonna end up losing against someone who's using the full who has their full rank firing at you. Worsening everything were the changes to the user interface. Unit cards could no longer be moved around, making unit management in the heat of battle more difficult than it had ever okay, been. Now, now I have a I have a much better Now that's the thing you can't move unit cards around in the box like I, I i the interface it's such a shame because this camera this is the modern camera from the same one as shogun 2 and and it feels it feels so good it just feels so like right speed like i didn't even have to i didn't even have to tune anything out of the box like this is the first i've played all the games in chronological order this is the first time i didn't have to play around with the camera settings first time i didn't have to play and look look how fast this is look 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 at how fast this is like i tell you like this game had so much potential this game it was a good game that was rushed and it, it, it was never fixed just imagine if they if they actually gave this game a bit more time in development it could have been and, and the proof is you can you can very easily fix it like i i don't i i'm not i'm not excusing like it should not be up to modders to fix these games but when when someone like darth mod can can fix a lot of the issues of this game someone who's unpaid not even working on the development team can do it in their spare time that tells you that tells you how much wasted potential the game had that, that tells you what what could have been done so some features had also been cut such as general speeches the population mechanic disease the choice between occupying looting and exterminating when capturing a settlement and enemy soldiers could no longer be taken prisoner to be held for ransom or executed. Settlements also had much more limited building slots. While this put a greater emphasis on opportunity costs, it also reduced the freedom one had to tailor settlements to their needs. They were also no longer split into castle and city categories, an interesting dilemma playing a major role in Medieval 2's campaigns. When combined, the resulting gameplay was far less engaging, with fewer meaningful decisions to be made. Executing prisoners to increase your general's dread? Not anymore, and the trade system was also heavily dumbed down. The previous games had had fantastic gameplay-derived storytelling that not only added some humanity to the experience, but depth to the gameplay itself. And now that was completely absent. Patches failed to rescue the game, and to make matters worse, some of the design decisions made in the transition from Medieval 2 to Empire would continue to damage the series for years. CA's willingness to add paid content to a broken game wasn't helping either, and they went so far as to sell Napoleon Total War as a standalone title when it clearly was a glorified expansion to Empire. It would not be the end of this lousy business practice, but that's the standard for the industry today. See, I'm not a monster. I'm just ahead of the curve. Jokes and dodgy business models aside, Napoleon Total War was a decent game in and of itself, improving on the line infantry warfare of its predecessor. The focus on the renowned French general went a long way in giving the game a sense of character that the generic empire had lacked. The campaign diplomacy featured options such as trade embargoes and demanding factions break alliances with a third party, and the more limited geographic scope of the different campaigns led to better balance. Whereas an empire, great powers like France and Spain could be knocked out shockingly quickly due to how few regions they held. For the first time in the series, units replenished automatically, so long as they were in friendly territory and led by a general or garrisoned in a town. There have been debates by series veterans on whether the system was superior to the manual retaining of troops in Empire and earlier, and while having to manually retrain units should, in theory, incentivize the player to more effectively use their troops, in practice it was so easy to make money that losses would generally only delay your progress. You could certainly design a game where manually retraining works well, but as far as Napoleon and its successor Shogun 2 are concerned, automatic replenishment worked fine within the constraints of their overall designs. 
While the series hadn't yet fully recovered from the laws of Empire, Napoleon was a few steps back in the right direction. It's a shame that CA's decision to treat it as a full release would damage the perceptions of what was a decent addition to the franchise. Don't worry though, because if you pre-order Shogun 2, you get to play as the Hattori. Wait, what? Okay, I wasn't into gaming news at the time, but I can imagine this being a cause for concern leading up to that game's launch. Total War hadn't had a fully-fledged successful release in nearly five years at that point, and CA's willingness to continue their DLC policy was, in hindsight, a taste of what was to come. Let's put a cap on that one for now. Gameplay is what matters most, and Shogun 2 was such a remarkable game that until today it's tough to believe they could release such a strong title only two years after CA's first major blunder. While population, disease, and the ability to take prisoners fail to make a return, the game's battles were considerably better than anything before, thanks to a responsive UI and tight unit balance. Swordsmen, spearmen, and cavalry consistently fought in a rock-paper-scissors style, with guns and other specialist units adding more dimensions to the combat, all of whom were dynamically affected by weather and terrain. This was a return to what had made the series stand out in the first place, combined with the convenience of a more modern interface and the luxury of graphics and sound design that still hold up well today. I mean, just look at these clips. In my time streaming this game to Twitch and uploading these videos, I've had viewers who were seeing this game for the first time and were surprised that it released a decade ago. Graphical fidelity combined with the Japanese art style and voice acting made it incredibly atmospheric. In contrast to battles, the campaign side saw a rather short list of developments. Research was no longer done in dedicated buildings as an empire, instead being confined to the tech tree, with the player being restricted to researching one tech at a time. This was far better for game balance since the player could no longer snowball research by taking over multiple provinces and building schools everywhere. Research was defined by opportunity costs, forcing you to decide what was truly the best path to take for your faction. As in the legendary campaign, you'd typically only be able to unlock half the arts by the time you completed your objectives. Though it wasn't a perfect implementation, because any good player will tell you most of the civic arts aren't worth going for. Despite this imbalance, the inability to create an ultimate army full of top tier fully upgraded units did wonders for the campaign's replay value. Further improving the game's campaign progression, instead of starting out with a large sprawling empire as in the previous two games, Shogun 2 started the player out with one or two provinces and a handful of units. It gave a sense of peril in the early turns and allowed the player to revel in the journey of building a superpower from humble beginnings. Similarly to the earlier Total War games, the campaign map gameplay wasn't particularly impressive and Rome 1 and Medieval 2 arguably did their civic management better, but Total War is first and foremost about the battles and Shogun 2's tight unit balance and much smoother UI made it the series strongest showing yet, and it doesn't stop there. While Rise of the Samurai was a forgettable DLC, Fall of the Samurai is an amazing standalone expansion that propelled the series into 19th century Japan where uniformed line infantry regiments shared the battlefield with samurai units. Priced as an expansion, but with the depth and scope of a full game, it was and remains the best value for money in the franchise's history. And if you're looking for a solid entry in the genre but unwilling to spend full price, I can't recommend this game enough. Much stranger than this weirdly priced bargain is the rest of CA's DLC policy towards Shogun 2 and its expansions. In addition to the Hattori pre-order bonus mentioned earlier, the company further damaged the integrity of the game by adding units that were either never worth recruiting or overpowered. Some units managed to fall into both categories, taking both too long to unlock in campaign while dominating in the multiplayer scene. A good example of this are the Tokugawa mounted gunners, taking over 50 turns to access in campaign while being incredibly difficult to counter in multiplayer, so much so that the average competitive rule set restricts players to two of them. There were a few other poorly balanced units added, although the saving grace was that most were faction specific. It's a shame that what was a tightly balanced game in version 1.0 was somewhat damaged by pay to win additions, even if rule sets and bans do a good job limiting the insanity in competitive play. Speaking of competitive play, Shogun 2 launched with a rich multiplayer. The co-op campaign that had been introduced with Empire was now fully functional, 
and the unit balance and smooth interface made multiplayer custom battles extremely satisfying to play. While free-for-all matches made no return, CA went to the extra mile with the addition of Avatar Conquest, a mode where players could design their own armies with a variety of cosmetics, from helmets to body armor to banners and more. They would then compete in matches against other players over a chessboard-like map of Japan, conquering provinces and gaining access to retainers and new units, for which abilities that they normally didn't have access to could be purchased with skill points. You may be wondering if the sheer number of potential combinations for units and their abilities could be a nightmare for balance, and you're correct. The mode can't really be described as fair, but I don't think it was even meant to be. Tactical awareness was still valuable, but if a fair fight was your biggest concern, you could just fall back to custom battles with the standard factions. It might not be possible to create a multiplayer mode that caters to everyone, but the game came pretty close by offering multiplayer battles in two flavors. It would all take a turn for the worse very soon. In late 2012, CAA announced a deal with Games Workshop to develop a series of Total War titles set in the Warhammer Fantasy universe. No one really paid attention to this news. Fans were all too fixated on the marketing material for the upcoming Rome 2. And I mean serious marketing material. There aren't a lot of videos like the Carthage trailer that can go from inciting awe to garnering near universal ridicule. But we'll get to that in a bit, don't you worry lads. We need to take a brief look at the Rome 2 promotional material in order to better understand its reception at release. Quite visually impressive, and we could perhaps be forgiven for being fooled, or maybe not. CA fooled us once with Empire being bad, then fooled us a second time when Shogun 2 actually worked. So in hindsight, maybe we should have expected them to subvert our expectations? Regardless, if you paid closer attention to the Rome 2 promotional material, like really close, you'd notice models spazzing out on the campaign map at this point in the Hannibal trailer. And as for the Greek State's pre-order bonus DLC, CAA was caught once again with their hands in the cookie jar, but that wasn't stopping them. The signs were there for the eagle-eyed, but players were far too busy pre-ordering to notice. I guess that means we kinda deserved the disaster we got at release? Was this some ingenious noble ploy by CAA to warn us about the dangers and stupidity of pre-ordering by collectively punishing us? If that sounds crazy to you, it won't by the time we get to the end of this video because trust me, CA goes full-on creative accounting from here, firing on all cylinders until a gasket probably fails in the near future. Rome 2's release was a historic event in the franchise's history. It broke the record for most concurrent players in any Total War game, nearly 120,000. But don't you think Rome 2 was finished? Figuratively and literally. It was a broken mess whose many layers of bugs and glitches only masked core design issues and major regressions from past games. Well, good fucking job, because it does make me want to quit! Uh, but we've also developed a lot of new technology altogether, so we have an entirely new siege battle AI. It will do stupid ass things like this. Here we go. There they come. Oh my god. Oh no. Just kidding. We wanted to knock down that fence. Here we go. Nope. <laughs> nope. Now JPEG. Do this shit. Nope. <laughs> The game was such a paradigm shift that I won't cover it all in this video because that would change this from a Total War documentary to why Rome 2 sucks. Reynolds Sanity made quite an excellent critique of the game nearly two hours long and even he missed some major issues. Let's run through some of the uh, additions made by this entry, now using never before seen footage from the game's development. Hey Bob, what are some things people complained about in Shogun 2? Well, Mr. Smith, I have statistics saying that siege battles were the most common battle in that game and it seems many players were annoyed by it. Oh really, Bob? Any ideas on how to fix that? Hmm, maybe we can allow players to design their own fortifications, like adding towers with specific types of ammunition, or maybe even allow units to dig trenches at any point in battle. Oh, you know how we have a budget 40% bigger than any previous games? Yeah? That means we can just remove the walls from most settlements. Wait, what? Is something the matter? I don't exactly follow, sir. It's so simple. We can fix the problem so easily and have the rest of the budget go into the marketing. It's genius. Yeah. What other issues are there? Well, some players find it really tedious to manage units on the campaign map in late game. Hmm. I got it. 
limit the number of armies a player can have, and also require armies to be led by generals. All right, but there's just one issue. What? You see, with all due respect, sir, restricting armies in that way will make the gameplay a lot more linear. What if they need to split off units to do other tasks? Ah, that's okay. No one even plays their campaigns past turn 40 anyway which is why we need to remove the realm divide mechanic. But that was the only thing that made late game challenging in Shogun 2. Just put in a civil war mechanic instead. Oh, okay, I'd like to know more about this mechanic. So at a random point in time, the mechanic will fire and a bunch of armies will spawn in a random location in the player's empire. Is this tied to any player decisions? Like if you're playing Rome and a general becomes too powerful? Nah, random. Maybe have it tied to food shortages? Nah, random all the way. All right, noted. Thanks, Bob. You're now free to go. Excuse me, sir? You're free to go look for another job. Wait, what? How else do you think we can pull together such a huge budget? Okay, but what about the droid attack on the Wookiees? Just when we thought that Empire Total War was just that one really bad game in the franchise, with Shogun 2 doing a great job repairing Trust in CA, they pulled the rugs from under our feet once again, only this time the damage would linger for years. While Empire suffered primarily from a lack of polish, Rome 2 marked a complete change in direction for the core design of these games. We're gonna go on a bit of a tangent discussing changes and stripped features, and it makes sense to do so since every entry following Rome 2 will inherit its problems. Right away, players noticed something was wrong with the implementation of the Testudo, which was indicative of a much larger problem. Formations had been reduced to a series of arbitrary stat modifiers. In the original Rome, the Testudo would make a unit nigh impervious to projectiles from the front, with decent protection on the sides, with none at the rear, as is intuitive for anyone who knows anything about the iconic formation. There were numbers and modifiers working under the surface, but they were unimportant to the player. All the player needed to know was the inherent advantages and disadvantages of the formation, thus informing their decision making. You didn't need to pull up a calculator to figure out what it was supposed to do. If you were utterly clueless, the game would offer you a brief, concise tooltip when hovering your mouse over the button. What did Rome 2 give us? Well... At launch, activating Testudo actually reduced your unit's protection against missiles, thanks to a wonderful coding error. I mean feature. It was the first time they had serious trouble with it and had to tweak it multiple times. On launch, it actually reduced protection against missiles. It was a liability. I want to put the Triarii into the, the hardest Ready part of the fight. They're the heaviest infantry that I've got. Testudo. My guys are dying. General. Mob. My god, we're taking bad losses, what the hell? But you see, kids, it's not about making mistakes, it's about correcting them, which CA understood when they patched the studio to grant units a flat armor bonus. That's right. Remember how in 2004 Rome 1 actually took into account the direction of your unit? We can't afford to do that now. Flat stat buffs that are completely divorced from what the individual men are doing are the future. CA wasn't done subverting our expectations. Remember all those history books you read that mentioned the importance of the high ground? When Rome 2 released, that advantage was reversed. I guess the game was developed in Australia. That was patched too, but unfortunately, that was only the beginning of their issues. If your real-time tactics military simulation game can't do basic terrain advantages correctly, then you're probably asking yourself what other bold features the game has. It turns out you're asking the wrong question because it seems the devs spent a lot of their time unloading features that had long been staples of the franchise. Moving units independently on the campaign map? Gone. You need a general to lead your armies and you can only recruit units directly into them. Splitting off units to garrison settlements, conquer undefended provinces and reinforce your frontline armies is just no longer possible. And this is true for every game going forward, excluding Rome Remastered, but that's just a half-baked re-release of Rome 1, and I don't think CA had the time to remove that feature, or maybe they forgot it existed. Restricting armies to generals was probably intended to reduce micromanagement, especially in late game, but all it really did was restrict the player's freedom while making the game far more tedious to play. To make matters worse, the amount of armies you could raise was now arbitrarily dependent on your Imperium rating or power level which, when combined with the removal of leaderless armies, made late game infuriating to play. You just wouldn't have enough armies to properly defend your large empire. This was made even worse by Rome 2's introduction of transport ships. Instead of having to invest in dedicated naval units as in previous games so that you could ferry your land units across water, you could now simply order your land units to move onto water. It's as hard to defend against as it sounds, and it would have been a bit more bearable if the transport ships weren't capable of destroying dedicated navies. 
Now, before I continue, you might already be typing out an angry comment explaining how these issues may have been patched out of the game, but I really don't care. A game's release build is the version that it should be judged by. If you're willing to excuse an unfinished game because it was fixed through patches, you're only reinforcing the gaming industry's awful practice of releasing buggy, broken messes with most advertised features being relegated to roadmaps, which major developers and publishers often don't follow through on anyway. All right, guys, today we are going to be delving into Rome 2 and seeing how well this game fares after all these years. They say it's been patched, but it, that, that it's a good game. Does Rome 2 is best Total War game in 2022? Every, I swear, every single, every like six months or so, I see that I see all those videos showing up. My recommendation is Rome 2 still worth it in this year as if it was ever worth it. Is Rome 2 the best? Well, let's check on a very fundamental level, okay? scrap all that crap let's see if this game actually functions on a very fundamental level because if it can't do what i'm about to do here if it can't simulate the combat i'm about to do here then i don't care what dlc that they've been adding to this game or what crap or what changes they made fundamentally this game is broken and right away right away i'm greeted by need in by needing to by, by having to have a general in my army so i can't even conduct unit tests without the general Second of all, I've been paying attention scrolling through these unit stats over here. And if you're paying attention to the unit stats, <clears throat> it's very, very strange. So first of all, why do I why do I have a bonus versus infantry line over here where it's zero? Okay, that's that's the first thing. All of these units, none of these units over here have a bonus versus infantry. So right away, the UI, the UI jumps out at you with some weird things and it gets worse. That's just the beginning. Look at as as you go up the stack melee attack goes up over here then goes uh, that jumps up sharply then it goes back down sharply and and same thing with melee defense so gladiators have high melee attack melee defense and then it goes down over here drops I, I, in this case the armor is differentiating them but when you go from legionaries to principes what is the difference what is the difference between these two units okay so one of them Principes have slightly lower armor, but but higher melee defense, whereas legionaries have lower melee defense, but so so poorly differentiated, just a small percentage difference. If this was if this was on a scale of hundred or whatever, that's only a tiny percentage difference. So these two units effectively the same, and then you go from principes to 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 legionary cohort, so you get higher armor, but again lower melee defense. Then when you go to Extraordinary, Socia Extraordinary, then you get slightly higher melee defense. Slightly higher melee defense, but their, their combat stats, actual melee attack and weapon damage are lower. Veteran Legionaries. Look at all these different units, okay? Different names. And look at how poorly, like, b going off the stats alone. Going off the stats alone. These, uh, I, I can't figure out how these units are differentiated from one another. It's very difficult. And then on top of that, not even the description itself. Like, maybe I want to go to the description. Maybe the unit description can help me. But not really. A heavy infantry force. Okay. The classic heavy infantry with good armor and exceptional morale. But that applies to, princi to Principes as well. Because their stats are basically the same. So these two, neither the stats nor the description are, are differentiating these units. So uh, to, uh, for all intents and purpose, these two guys, these are these are these are the same unit just with different unit cards and probably look very similar in game. And and that's just the very start. So you have all this melee infantry. And if if you're gonna tell me, well, uh, Shogun Two, uh, Shogun Two was a bad game, or it, it just it just got really bland because because it has it has low unit variety. In Shogun Two. Almost every single unit, almost every single unit is well differentiated. Katana Samurai, you had only two, you had two main sword units in Shogun 2. Katana Samurai, no Dachi Samurai. And they were both very well differentiated. One of them was very charge oriented, but very fragile. No Dachi Samurai are basically a glass cannon. Whereas Katana Samurai are, are brawlers. They, they, you throw them into a fight and you just expect them to last over there. Those are two very well differentiated units. They play a very, both of them play a very important role on the battlefield and they're well differentiated. Whereas over here, your unit variety or whatever you want to call it, these two units are effectively the same. Don't get fooled by it. If you, 
if you think this game has better unit variety in a meaningful way you're just a sucker you you just fell for what ca wants you to think over here let's go down to spear infantry if the situation improves so with spear infantry you have you have fewer spear units so they're 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 better differentiated in terms of spat in terms of stats but there's another issue because as you go up the stack <clears throat> you're just getting you're just unlocking better units in 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 past games different units in in shogun 2 in fall of the samurai different units in the same stack had different abilities in shogun 2 yari ashigaru had the yari wall which yari samurai did not have so it wasn't a strict upgrade and people in multiplayer in multiplayer of shogun 2 in the multiplayer of shogun 2 it was very common for it's very very common for people to bring both yari ashigaru and yari samurai in the same army even though one is more expensive than the other because they're well differentiated but anyway let's go into the actual fight over here and all these units over here the entire all the units in this stack over here share the same morale for the most part then you go into this stack lower they also mostly share the same morale i'm gonna go for socia extraordinary in this army three of them and the general is gonna mess things up but okay let's let's look at how this combat measures up actually you know what i'm gonna do i'm gonna take only uh, vigilis or whatever these guys are called and i'm gonna go and try and replicate the yari ashigaru and light cavalry get the weakest unit of cavalry this is a litmus test okay you want to know how well the foundation you want to test the foundation of any total war game you're playing you get a unit you get a bunch of units of spear infantry the lowest quality spear infantry and the lowest quality cavalry and then you place them against mid-tier infantry take you can also test this against high tier but you want to main concern go for mid-tier infantry and i'm going i am going for the lowest quality units okay you can bring up a defense saying you're bringing low quality units look this is total war the whole the whole the whole selling point of total war is being able to take out to to, to defeat superior forces with to defeat higher quality units with your own superior tactics you know your actual brain you know, they're gonna charge directly into us let's see what happens over here and i want to get rid of the general first and foremost because I, I i would i would not i would take out i would get rid of the generals right away i mean i would i would test this without the generals anyway so i need to look at look at how quickly look at how quickly those health bars are just tumbling right now they haven't taken a single loss these enemy units haven't taken a single loss yet We'll see if that changes with... I want to I wanna get the general first and foremost. One man has died. I have charged two cavalry units. These are two of the weakest cavalry units into the general. One of them into the rear of the general. And they've only lost three men. They've only lost three men. Here, here you have it, guys. Higher quality units being unreasonably strong. Even when you adopt actual military tactics and try to use everything at your disposal. It just, it just screws with you my men my men have taken equal losses my men have taken equal losses because and look at this cavalry charge not a single man died in the cavalry charge not a single man died in the enemy cavalry charge not a single man died in the cavalry charge this is this is apparently a fixed game guys so yes rome 2 is the best total war game in 2022 F me one they have lost they have lost less than 10 men fewer than 10 men among these three units okay let's let's do let's get another clean cavalry charge going again i don't think i don't think we even killed the general but come on come on let's see this let's see this is this is a very long rundown this should be a good charge nope not a man not a single man died not a single man died not a single man got knocked over not a single man died this is just one battle you know i'm not, I'm not even gonna test the more elite units I, i'm not i'm not even gonna test the more elite units i went for a mid-tier enemy unit or ai unit over here and my cavalry are completely impotent completely impotent losing current combat as well so these guys these uh, these uh, these uh, socia extraordinary got charged in the rear but they turned around to actually beat my men in the melee yeah and, and they're not even these aren't even an anti-cavalry unit 
and and they and they and they and they they're managing to beat my cavalry handily in the melee even though they got charged in the rear how can anyone insist how can anyone insist that this has been a fixed game i gar i i i will tell i i promise you load 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 a similar battle into shogun 2 load this or any past like shogun 2 rome 1 medieval 2 load a battle with pike infantry your weakest defensive unit your weakest defensive spear units or pike infantry even in medieval 2 load the battle in okay and then the weakest offensive unit you can find the weakest sword unit or the weakest cavalry unit and do the same thing hammer and anvil see what happens you will win the battle you will win the battle within a minute the same type of battle with the same unit archetypes you will win that in under a minute they will start routing okay it takes one charge one yari ashigaru in yari wall against a katana samurai and then a single charge light cavalry charge into the rear of that katana samurai to win that battle katana samurai are a mid-tier unit that have double the morale of yari ashigaru they are light cavalry and yari ashigaru are your lowest tier in their respective classes katana samurai over here and yet they get absolutely shredded when you adopt actual military tactics what, what's going on over here not only did i lose the battle i lost it horrifically Hor horrifically horrifically I, I i don't even know if it's worth testing the higher quality units because if 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 i lost this badly to socii extraordinary what happens when i bring in praetorians what happens what happens when i bring in praetorians and of course my general is performing better than all these units of course my general as in terms of kd he is performing better than all these units and you know why this is happening guys part of why this is happening it's those bloody health bars okay chipping away at units health but barely any kills actually registering poorly designed game just from the very foundation it's it's here it's evidence you can load up this battle and do it yourself and try to win i don't even know hang on i, I want to see I i'm i'm curious to see <clears throat> Um, I'm curious to see what difficulty I set over here. Is this the hardest difficulty? If this is not the hardest difficulty. Yep, that is on very hard. So this is as good, as challenging as the game gets. This is supposed to be as rewarding as this game gets. I want to see unit info. Yep. Part of it is because these units have better health. They just happen to have more health than mine. Not only... Not only do they have better armor, better better stats, better armor, better melee defense, they also have... <clears throat> not better melee defense. They also have better health, so it takes more hits to kill an individual soldier. So it, <clears throat> it, is, it is confirmed that in this game, your only, way, your only way to efficiently beat a certain quality level of unit is to bring the same level or superior quality. It's not... It is not, there is no way to make these units cost effective. There is no way to make these cheap units cost effective. And that is, that that shows you that this game is just rotten at the core. There is no way that you can make up for this problem because that's going to permeate through the rest of the balance. I could, I could bring my own Socii Extraordinary, but what if the other person's bringing Praetorian Guards? It becomes, it, it turns the game into just bring the most expensive unit you can have bring the most expensive unit you can have otherwise you're just leaving you're just leaving your own performance on the table which is just a terrible way to balance the kind of this kind of game there should be trade-offs as you go up the stack there there should be the, the game should reward you for resourcefulness Br just bringing a higher quality unit that is not resourceful there's nothing resourceful especially in multiplayer or custom battles where you just have funds and you have all these units accessible there's nothing resourceful or interesting just about bringing higher quality units and slamming them together and that's it that's the combat that's what total war is total war is this it's the combat you can talk to me you can tell me about how great the campaign is or how much effort they put into the campaign which has its own problems by the way that is not true but even if even if the campaign even if they made the campaign the campaign side of things extremely robust if the battles themselves are just absolute garbage what is the point of all of it what is the point of all of it the point of the campaign has always been to add weight and context to the battles to add weight and context to the battles there are decisions that you have to take into account in the campaign battle that you don't take into account in multiplayer in multiplayer 
it's 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 much more reasonable to to uh, throw away units in suicidal attacks as baits than it is in single player because you, you, you don't have to replenish your losses after a battle in custom battles. But when the combat itself is so terrible, what is there to look forward to? What is am I gonna? Should I look forward to having my? Should I look forward to having my my cheap units, uh, even though they're being given tactical advantages? Even if they're being given tactical advantages, even if they're fighting in formation, even if they're supported, their flanks are protected, even if they outnumber the enemy units, even if they have cavalry supporting on the flanks and getting multiple charges off, should I be looking forward to this? Is this something to look forward to? How is this rewarding in any way of me pushing on the game systems? If if the whole system is to just get the best unit you can get, then that's just that's just a, that's just an objective downgrade. From what Total War is about, it's a completely objective downgrade. This ca you cannot state that this is more interesting. It's not an opinion that this that this is less interesting. I have demonstrated that there is less that you can do with the system. There is simply less gameplay to be had over here. In the older games, in the older games, you could have it both ways. You could you could go all out crazy, bringing hero units, bring bring stupidly expensive overpowered units and just slam them together you could have fun and meme around with your friends in older games that was already a part of total war that was already there but at the same time if you wanted to actually get serious you could so you did it this you didn't get anything over here you got just half the experience they, they didn't they didn't make the game more accessible they just <coughs> They, they didn't make the game more accessible by doing this. It's just as accessible as it was, but they took away all the depth, so there's no point in coming back to it. Once you figured out, once you figured out that you just bring a higher quality unit so that you can just perform better, there's nothing more to be done there. There is nothing more well, you just, you just the there. There is nothing more to be had. And if you if you tell me, yeah, well, you just ran a unit test, so there are people who have more experience. I have about 100 hours in this game, okay, in campaign and battles. I gave this game such a fair chance over the years, so many times. Okay, 100, 100 total hours. Okay, I think I think I have a decent idea for how this game functions, and it does not. It is it is an objective downgrade from Fall of the Samurai, which came directly before it, and it is also a downgrade from Medieval One, Medieval Two, the original Shogun, on a fundamental level. This may this may as well be a different series at this point, made by a different developer. The the, the difference in designs, design philosophy is incredibly staggering. It's incredibly misguided. They they threw away all of the depth that was in older games for nothing, for nothing. You do, you cannot tell me that they they took that away so that they could give you something else. They gave you nothing else. They took it away. They dumbed it down. They gave you nothing else. What they gave you in return is this window dressing where you have 15 or 20 melee units that are all poorly differentiated that have all of the barely stat differentiated that's all they gave you they gave you window dressing that's all they gave you in return and that is that is the tragedy over here and this is the series going forward every game going forward is going to inherit this template inherit this model this terrible model Alright guys, in a different Total War game, we're gonna show you what it's like when a game actually is designed in a way where it allows you, it rewards resourcefulness. And I have two units of cavalry, one unit of katana cavalry, which is heavy cavalry, quite expensive, and the weakest unit of light cavalry, the weakest unit of cavalry, versus a unit of Yachty Samurai, and this is... This is the quintessential anti-cavalry unit. This has a an incredibly high bonus versus cavalry on top of having good morale. So even they, they have not only do they have good morale, they also have they're extremely effective against cavalry. This is what they're supposed to do. This is a matchup that they excel at, or they should excel at, but I'm about to turn it on its head. Okay. I'm I'm about to turn it on its head. And this is more than just a question of just unit quality. Okay. If there was if if there was if there was a weaker unit of cavalry over here, if there was a weaker unit of ca of katana of sword wielding cavalry over here, this would still be possible because the game is so well designed that I can I can conceptualize what matchups look like based on a few core principles that this game is designed around. I know that swords will consistently beat 
spears i know that spears will consistently beat cavalry i know that cavalry will consistently beat um swords or archers or anything in the melee that it catches in the melee that isn't wielding a spear and just from those basic from those basic facts those basic cornerstones of the gameplay those basic tenets of the gameplay i can conceptualize i can predict relatively what within error what the outcome of a certain engagement is and i can formulate i can make decisions based on that all right it's more interesting than just bringing a more expensive unit yari samurai can beat i i i have used yari samurai for this in campaign because they're so reliable for this they can beat multiple units of cavalry even if they're getting swamped even if they are getting swamped they will beat they will handily beat multiple units of cavalry at the same time and that's one of their advantages in multiplayer yari ashigaru have are really good for like fighting cavalry one on one but they have terrible morale so if they get isolated and surrounded by cavalry they're gonna they're, they're gonna get shredded so here's what I'm gonna do. If you think if you think I'm gonna charge this unit straight down, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit the dismount button. And I hit the dismount button with a hotkey. You can't do that in Three Kingdoms. You can't hotkey formations or abilities to, to, to however you want. But I can over here. I didn't have to click a button. So watch it. Katana. Katana cavalry dismounted. Now that gives me a small unit of katana samurai with a bonus versus spear infantry. And the thing is, the thing is, we took a lot of losses on the katana, the katana samurai in the beginning because the Yari samurai had rapid advance, had uh, or had have a really good charge bonus. So yeah, so we won that. I'm, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna try that a second time. I can do even better. So I won that. I managed to win that already. That's a point in this game's favor. This is something. If I was not if I was not able to dismount cavalry, I would not be able to do this. I would not be able to even conceive of this, conceive of beating a unit of the Yari Samurai. Now you see, I already I already learned that it's possible. So now I'm pushing on this knowledge that I have. If, let's say I'm experimenting, I'm finding this out for this first time. My next question is, how can I how can I take that a step further? This is actual gameplay over here. I'm I'm trying to think of ways to improve my performance over here that isn't just that isn't that doesn't just boil down to get more expensive units and you'll do better. So they have they have taken the bait of my light cavalry right now. They have completely taken the bait of my light cavalry. And that's this is where I pull in. So they're, they're going to scatter my horses. And that's another thing. That's another thing. You can scatter people's horses. You can scatter horses in this game so that the whoever whoever dismounted no longer has access to it. They can no longer remount. That is something you can do. Look at all this that's happening. Just in a, in a basic, in a very basic unit test. In a very basic unit test. Look at all of this crap that's happening. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to charge them in the rear with my light cavalry. I'm going to charge them in the rear with my light cavalry, then pull out. I'm going to pull out right away. I'm going to pull out right away. I took only two losses. That way my katana, that way my katana cavalry can get, can get a clear charge. We avoided, we avoided the high charge bonus of katana, of, of Yari Samurai just, just by just by abusing our mobility just by abusing the mobility of cavalry i managed to completely negate their charge advantage and look what's happening over here okay look what's happening look what's happening and that is a broken unit that's it we broke a unit of yari samurai we completely turned a matchup on its head completely turned completely turned a matchup on its head we lost 11 and 13 men 24 24 horsemen in total 24 horsemen in total just to get rid of a unit of to get rid to get rid of a unit of yari samurai the quintessential anti-cavalry unit didn't even stand a chance didn't even stand a chance wiped out entirely why because i actually i actually made use of the of the of the systems that are in place put in place by the game you can't you can't you can't even attempt to do this in a game like warhammer you can't even attempt because you can't even dismount cavalry in that game 
you can't even dismount cavalry in that game. So this, this, you can't even conceive of this in this game. Rome 2's combat system is dysfunctional. It. And we all know it's a Total War game with bad battles is a bad Total War game. CA never explicitly acknowledged the issues or their failures, claiming that only a small percentage of players were having problems running the game. But their unprecedented patching spree and their decision to effectively re-release the game a year later with the Emperor Edition said it all. While many of the bugs and optimization issues were ironed out and series staples like guard mode and fire at will made a glorious return, the majority of the game's core design issues were left unsolved. In fact, they were far more visible now that they weren't masked by glitches and crashes. CAA also continued to show their talent for reading the room by peddling DLCs in spite of the game's obvious problems. But did the game get anything right? It took me a long time to find any positive additions that Rome 2 brought to the series, and I did stumble upon one, the Fog of War mechanic or line of sight on the battle map. Instead of hiding being exclusive to forested areas or some specialist units, visibility was far more dynamic, with the game factoring in even slight undulations in the terrain to determine the visibility of units. It's an awesome mechanic that would have been great to interact with in a much better game. All right. Just very methodical. Oh no, 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 no. Get out of there. Get out of there, guys. Okay. I can use this unit of Yarikachi to route these units. Start a chain route over here. Okay, who cares? I don't know. I I I I think I think they're they're a bit faster when throwing from outside. I don't know. Maybe it's the angle or something. So those units are effectively not contributing to the fight at all. We have the ability to attack to defeat the melee units first. And we that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to defeat the melee units, break them. We lost our general, but we have unbreakable morale. We do not care. Massively. 319 kills. Come on, get your general over here. I want the general to get involved again. Come on. Yeah, this Despite good. the damage done by Rome 2, there was still a faint hope that this would be just another really bad one, like Empire, and the series would get back on track. As some nightmares do come true, that never happened. There would not be another Shogun 2-esque entry to restore hope. Total War Attila would launch in 2015, and it had already been off to a bad start considering it looked to be an expansion to Rome 2 being oversold as a full game. Which it did turn out to be. Kinda reminds me of another glorified expansion. But let's answer the most important question as always. Was it a good game? Oh, and of course, uh, I actually, I need to add a commander. I need to add a commander to my army because that's, that's what we're dealing with over here. Cannot just, I cannot have unit on unit fights at all. Good morale. Everything has good morale over here. So is everything going to be... If if everything is going to have good morale, then I think everything is just going to be a slugfest, which is not not exactly... Um, it's not, that's not exactly promising. So I want I want pike wall and I want to flanking force my... Uh, and this is the line of sight mechanic. Look. Look. Line of sight. Coming in, coming into effect over here. Just imagine, imagine, imagine how much, how, how amazing this would have been in a, in a better game. But anyway, we're just going to wait for them. We have, um, I'm assuming they are in pike formation. It says they're in pike formation. Or that's, no, that's just the icon. Okay. The enemy approaches. And, then, and, then, and then they don't even, they don't even close their ranks. They, 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 they don't even close their ranks. Oh, what is up with the... Uh... Yeah, they, they don't even close their ranks when they do that. What is what is the point? How how are these guys even braced? How are they braced against a cavalry charge? And uh, not only how are they braced, uh, not forget cavalry. Enemy infantry can just walk through the gaps. What is the point of a pike wall? If you're supposed to layer the pikes on top of each other, this really isn't like. Look at this huge gap. An entire man, probably two men, can can squeeze through one of these gaps if they wanted to. But anyway, they're... The hmm. enemy general is dead! 
Okay, no, I should I should change up. So I've done one battle. This is with very strong Eastern Roman units. These guys have good charge bonus. Uh, these guys have uh, have an actual missile they could use, but they're the same morale. So then you come over here and then morale drops for whatever reason. So 45 morale. So if if we're going if we're going along the scale over here, there's not much difference in terms of morale between the lowest quality unit over here and the highest quality units. If 45 to 34, that is a that that isn't even a 30% increase from the lowest quality, which should be the lowest quality unit. And then these medium pike infantry have better morale than these elite Roman units. And then bows, archers have the same morale. Archers have the same morale as as trained melee infantry for whatever reason. They have they have the same morale as these units. Why archers ranged units? When when you look at when you look at ranged units and you compare them to melee units across the same tier. So let's say in Shogun 2, if you if you take Katana Samurai and Bow Samurai, they're both Samurai units. They are both Samurai units, but Bow Samurai out of the box have less have lower morale than Katana Samurai because morale morale is more is a more melee centric um, uh, aspect of gameplay. Bow Samurai, if your Bow Samurai are getting involved in the melee, that that means the battle is probably over at that point. So it makes sense to have them have lower morale. Those units. Those units are meant to be protected. They're meant to be sheltered. That's why they have lower morale. The lower morale illustrates that. You want to keep them out of harm's way for as, as best as you can. But here, when you look at the archers, you have, you have archers. These archers have roughly equal, or even in some cases, superior morale to these trained melee units. Heavy melee infantry have 34 morale compared to 36 on armored sagittar you could say well it's a i don't care if it's historically accurate okay and in, in, in real history in, in 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 real history you didn't need to have a general leading your army you could have a captain leading a smaller army but they clearly didn't think that that was that that was necessary to include in this game so your 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 whole historical accuracy arguments came here and then and then these very light skirmishers no it gets worse these very light skirmishers have 34 morale 34 morale which is equal to these heavy melee infantry by the by the game's own distinction these are heavy melee infantry and you'd think that heavy melee infantry part of that would be having having better morale it's intuitive you get heavier units with better armor you would expect them to have better morale be, be to, to be to be richer able to support themselves with that armor being better trained as well you would expect that but I, you know, I, I suppose I should be grateful that artillery actually has lower morale than, than, uh, than trained melee infantry. That that would have been actually that would have actually been funny if, uh, if, uh, if if uh, if artillery crews have the same morale as like trained infantry melee infantry. I, I want to look at the generals right now and look at their. So you have you have one of the general units has the, these two general units have forty three morale. They have equal morale to. To these medium melee infantry why do these units have equal morale well, you should expect your general to to be one of the last units to break from battle or cheating from battle if he doesn't get killed before he retreats anyway anyway let's go for the lowest quality units over here and they at least at least they kept the army composition intact let's start this. so it seems it seems they might have compensated for the the terrible like the way morale is balanced and how elite units are just so difficult to beat in rome 2 by just narrowing the range of morale that units have so there isn't much that much that big of a morale difference between the lowest quality and the highest quality it's maybe a 20 or 30 percent difference which is not which is not substantial in older games the the morale difference would usually be twice like when you move from one tier to the next you usually get like a hundred or an 80 percent increase in terms of morale and you know it's not the numbers again it's not the numbers that are important it's the dynamic that those numbers create when you have such a narrow spread of morale it doesn't it, it takes away an, an important differentiating element of the different units your higher quality units no longer have such a huge morale advantage over the lower quality ones okay and they are raising they are raising their pikes they, they are raising their pikes to go back into position to fill in fill in to fill in to fill in the line the gaps left by their comrades yeah 
Okay, they're gonna charge. Oh, so I, I give them I give them an attack order, and instead of instead of actually going forward, this is something that's always been a problem with spears. I I think pikes at least since Empire. It's even in Shogun too. This happens sometimes, where they they just take a weird path of attack, and they get then then they end up getting attacked in the rear for their stupidity. Should be dro these guys should be dropping like flies. They are fighting against pikes. They are fighting against pikes, but apparently, apparently, pikemen lose to cavalry. Apparently, you know, pikemen lose to cavalry. And these aren't just these aren't trash pikemen. These are medium pikemen. But uh, according to this game, they they according to this game, they actually lose and they they start losing when that happens. So we'll see. Uh, yep. I'm going to I'm going to have to I'm going to have to throw in I'm going to have to throw in another unit of pikes. So whereas whereas Rome 2 had elite units being way too powerful, this game this game seems to have done the opposite, gone the opposite direction. I I don't see uh and I I'm, I'm I haven't even tested cavalry because I know I've heard that cavalry are just absolutely bonkers in this game. They're just so poorly balanced. But there's definitely a dynamic showing up where where elite units just aren't don't seem to be worth the cost. It's kind it's kind of funny they went they went and overcorrected it seems and they went in just in the complete opposite direction. <laughs> okay, that's that's funny. You do you, CA. And then there's there's these elite sword infantry, elite melee infantry. For some reason, these guys, the highest tier of melee infantry over here, have a higher melee defense than guys with spears and and giants and giant shields hang on I, I need to see something are there do these guys have shields if they have smaller shields it seems and then and then the unit scaling is terrible over here so instead of instead of higher tier units actually having fewer men that you would expect they all have the same number of men and I, i'm guessing that's because the the way the game differentiates them is through health so instead of instead of units being visibly differentiated like lower tier you have you have higher tier units as you go up the stack you have smaller unit numbers and by having smaller unit numbers that means that in 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 fall of the samurai and shogun 2 that meant that they were more vulnerable to gunpowder weapons that was such an interesting dynamic it added a whole another dynamic to the game it gave you tools with which to dismantle heavy units heavy infantry you could not only could you adopt standard tactics like hammer and anvil you also had an entire unit class that was geared towards countering towards murdering elite units so you come into this game and it's a complete paradigm shift all of these units have the same unit size from the highest to the lowest and they're differentiated in terms of health pools and they don't even have any units that properly counter these elite units that, that are that are, de are dedicated towards countering these elite units which leads to what you get in Rome 2 where elite units just win battles they just win battles but in this game because the, the way they balance to the morale is that there's it doesn't scale up enough so that the elite units aren't worth getting like skirmishers slingers these guys like the, the morale spread look at the morale pay attention to the morale as I go through these units it's all between 34 and 50 at the very highest between 34 and 51 at the very highest maybe you know if, if we're gonna be charitable maybe maybe it doesn't scale in a linear manner maybe the, maybe it's like logarithmic so the difference uh, 50 a morale of 50 might be six or seven times more than a morale of 30 but it's not it's not illustrated within the game that's not something i know all it tells me is you know a unit high morale okay that's something that i know but again it's it's so poorly laid out it's it's so poorly laid out so obscure and then the the spread is so is so tiny that it it kind of negates morale as a, as a mechanic in these games did they okay they place defenses down over here okay here they come here it comes here it comes Now look how bad the charges are. They just slap into the units. Yeah, some units are almost... These two guys are still nearly at full strength. Combat even. We have combat even between Tagmata Cavalry and Elite Immortals. This should never be happening. On level ground... On level ground, this should never be happening. Charging directly into pikes. This should never, ever be happening. But here you have it, guys. It has been... It has been nearly two minutes. It has been nearly two minutes of me fighting... 
of me of me bogging down all of these units of pikes this means you could actually use cavalry to bog down a unit of pikes like if you have elite pikes if you have a unit of elite pike infantry against you you could you could bog them down with your own cavalry that is insane that you can do that in no military in no in no military simulator that has any respect for yourself should this be taking this long to resolve itself i don't care how good your cavalry are It's been two and a half minutes. It has been two and a half minutes. These units are still in the fight. These two guys are still in the fight. So guys, that took... That is two minutes. Uh, sorry, three minutes. It took three whole minutes for this fight to resolve. That should be... That matchup, they should wipe the floor. That is the most favorable matchup. That is one of the best matchups you could give a unit of pikes. And yet... It took three minutes. Imagine, imagine having somebody like a, a player, someone in multiplayer tying down your unit of pikes with cavalry. And keep in mind, I'm not even, I'm not even cycle charging. I could imagine if I, if I attempted to cycle charge and preserve my cavalry even further, how long, how long do you think I would be able to keep the, to keep these units tied down with units of cavalry? That is insane. Pikes, pikes should be a threat to cavalry. They should be used to fend off cavalry. They should be an absolute menace to cavalry that's their whole point but if for some reason it's the reverse <laughs> it's the reverse you could you could tie down an entire an entire arm of pikemen just not even like just one unit of cavalry if you if you so desired and win and win an advantage somewhere else completely backwards it is completely backwards no person coming from the older total war games where things functioned the way you would based on how it was in actual history you know if you want something to actually be historically accurate i do not think I do not think these uh, these guys charging directly into a pike line and lasting for five minutes is uh, and, and taking uh, let me see 50 60 taking more 60 oh my god taking more than 150 men with them I do not think that that would happen that would actually happen they lost they lost 213 men they lost more men than I did they lost more men than I did even though I ended up routing, so uh, this is uh, this is some of these kills. Some uh, some of these kills were gotten from from routing units. They scored some of these kills from routing units, so those don't even count. In the actual fight, we are we are basically one for one right now. We charged our cavalry head on into their direct counter. These should be the hard counter to cavalry, and these units are also larger, so these men are outnumbered. Charging head on into them, and yet we are basically one for one in terms of losses. It didn't release with an utterly broken AI, so by Rome 2 standard, it could be a resounding success. And therein lies the issue that doomed Attila and continues to haunt the franchise. These games have inherited Rome 2's design philosophy of being overly restrictive towards the player on the campaign map, while oversimplifying the battle systems. There would be no major additions to the series with later entries, and in some areas the regressions continued, especially in the Warhammer titles which have been the only long-term commercial success that CA has had in the past decade. The Warhammer titles not only inherit the decisions made in Rome 2, but add to them with an emphasis on overpowered characters that can't even be permanently killed. Keeping your generals safe used to be an important aspect of gameplay, informing your decisions both on the campaign map and in battle. Some of the most memorable Total War moments are centered on them. Anyone who played Rome 1 or Shogun 2 remembers having their one general they had been building up the whole campaign, dying after fighting to the bitter end. No matter how powerful or feared they became, there was no escaping their mortality. Charging your general into combat in one last desperate move to win a battle was gut-wrenching, and it felt heroic regardless of the result. And that arose from a little something called tension. Tension, risk, danger, whatever word you use, they're all essential for building stakes and creating investment in characters and their struggles. And that's not easy to do when you have a lord who can single-handedly fight off entire armies. What you're left with is a game that fails on both a gameplay and narrative level. 
regardless of it being accurate to the lore. Because if it was indeed accurate to the lore, if it's true that characters in Warhammer Fantasy can so easily overcome what should be tall odds, then the source material itself has problems. Is Lord of the Rings great because Frodo single-handedly defeated Sauron's armies head-on? Or is it great because we had multiple characters banding together, all with their own hopes, desires, skills, outlooks and flaws, all putting aside their differences to fight a common enemy, with a few giving their lives along the way, and some who made it through were left scarred for life? Royalty and power couldn't save Boromir and Théoden from death, and the story is far stronger for it. Overpowered characters aren't the only damaging feature introduced by the Warhammer titles. What makes them even more prevalent is the vaguely named supply lines mechanic, which causes the upkeep of your units to increase exponentially with the more units you form and the more distinct units you choose to field. That's right. Not only are you unable to command units on the campaign map individually, your armies will become prohibitively expensive to maintain if you attempt to put together balanced builds. Remember when you simply managed your funds to get what you wanted instead of the game restricting your allowance like an overbearing parent who worries you'll have too much fun? Uh, hello everyone. So today we're going to be doing a bit of an experiment. We're just going to be trying out handgunners with uh, 10 times the unit size and just test out how um, the unit interacts with height and terrain and how that feature plays out. Now, I don't necessarily know how this is going to play out because I do know that handgunners are very awkward in the way in which they've been designed by Creative Assembly, given that they don't reload, there's no, like, they don't fire by rank, and the rounds they fire don't go out in a straight line. Massive, thick blocks, boy. All right, so Carl Friends will be able to like, holy sh oh yeah, and he can spawn more, eh? Jesus Christ. Fucking betas, fire. So you see how they're like little pellets? Yeah, we're gonna wait till they reload. So yeah, as I said, like every rank is gonna be able to fire. Like there's no way that this guy is able to see what's below the hill. Like as you can see, there, there's clearly an arc for the projectile, but yet it just goes right through the unit. And then the guns kind of like recharge like in Star Wars. Okay, here, here it goes. So they're gonna, they're gonna use fire by rank. We're gonna get some actual firing drills in here. Yeah, I forgot, I forgot how wimpy, how wimpy the guns sound in this game. Stock. Yeah, come on, come on, guys, do your thing, do your thing. Platoon fire. Yeah, here it is. Look, this game, this game had actual potential. Look at this. This is just amazing. Actual firing drills. Actual, well thought out firing drills. You're gonna, you're gonna fire in advance? Fire in advance. I want to see fire in advance. Come on, come on. Fire in advance. A bit sluggish, but okay. Yeah, look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Total War Three Kingdoms was announced on January 11th, 2018, and it seemed it would mark some sort of a return to the more grounded combat the series had long since abandoned. This could be inferred by CA's decision to split the game's campaign into two modes. Romance mode, which would place a greater emphasis on the characters featured in the epic from which the game derived its setting, and records mode, which would be a more traditional Total War experience. In my case, I was so starved of a proper follow-up to Shogun 2's gameplay that the marketing did its job, and after buying the game not long after its launch in early 2019, it would only take a few hours of playing records for me to realize that I, and probably many others, had been utterly fooled. There are some problems with the way this design. Like, why can I only place barricades at these? Uh, at these, at these. Why can they only be placed at these predetermined zones? Why can't I place them? Like, can I? Is it possible to place barricades? No, I don't see anything. 
I don't see anything. Okay, and that's good also. I just verified that guard mode exists in the game. So uh, you, you, all you get, you, you get so much room to like maneuver in. So, uh, so much potential for just maneuvering, taking up strong defensive points, defense in depth, attrition. But then you get this barricade that it's just predetermined. Like, why can't I just place this wherever I want? Imagine, imagine if you could place the barricades wherever you want on the map. And and the only the, the only thing restricting you was you had to consider the amount of time and the opportunity cost because if if you if you're committing one unit to build a barricade that's one less unit actually in the fight so it's not something it has its own risk reward it's not something that you will do all the time so there's no need there's no need to restrict it to these certain areas it already has its own restrictions naturally from the gameplay that's emergent but then this is and then I have five barricades remaining okay so where can I so so it so it defaults so it defaults to romance when you want to go into campaign that tells you everything about the way the developers want you to play it this tells you the fact that you it defaults to romance and then you get records as a sort of side mode okay that that, that doesn't even change anything from the main campaign that the, from the records from the romance campaign all it really does is a more traditional unit-centric total war battle. So generals run into battle accompanied by units of capable bodyguards. It doesn't change the fact that the generals are insanely overpowered. And the annoying character system. So it's still heavily character-centric. And, and, and you get units arbitrarily restricted. And their formations and everything restricted to the generals and the characters you have. It's it's A lot of these just aren't... They aren't self-explanatory, ambitious. So you get... Decreased desire for higher office than higher desire for, you know, 50% desire for higher office. How do these, like you see, it doesn't, it doesn't really even make sense when you think about it logically. Like you get, he's dutiful. He doesn't want, he, he wants, he has a lesser desire for higher office than he has more over here. Plus 5% income from all sources. You see these, these modifiers over here, you have to go reading over all these modifiers. A lot of these nouns just aren't self-explanatory. The, in the older games, you didn't need to pay attention. Even even in Rome One, even in Rome One, where you had like complex character trait systems and and you know Shogun Two's retainers, that that stuff wasn't even central to the gameplay. It was more of an extra layer that you didn't even need to care about if you didn't want to. You could you could get away just playing the game and not paying attention to that crap. And even if you did want to pay attention to it, it's mostly self-explanatory. And then okay, right away you have all of the all of the modifiers and spreadsheeting and like the arbitrary mechanics. So credibility, credibility is a unique resource for the faction. So instead of credibility being based on your, um, based on your actions, you're already being told it's just it's being reduced to a resource. Basically, to a currency that you gain through certain actions. Each action has a certain current has a certain amount of credibility attached to it. So we have Wei Tang. And this is this is a nice feature, you know, zooming out as far uh, like you have one continuous zoom into basically the diplomatic situation. That's good. But unfortunately, the the good part about the map design in this game just fades apart really quickly. For some reason, I don't know what it is with the way these games are, just the, with the way they look. Either I don't know if it's the depth of field that's really off or just the texture quality, but it is just really hard to make out what you're looking at. Like, is this? From a distance, like is this is this a road or a river? I can't tell. And then the bridge being so tiny, barely visible, like these things are just it makes it really hard to know what you're looking at. And even the settlements, the settlements are so hard to see on the map. You have to look at the icon. Th this is not th this is this is not this is not good. The game this is this is what I would like to refer to as like an over reliance on UI or UI overload, where instead of the the game world actually giving you useful information, they just shove these icons in your face. Why can't I? Why, why you know I don't need, I I don't really need these oversized icons to tell me there's settlement here. The settlement itself should be easy to distinguish. Those are basically the object of gameplay. You are fighting for settlements. That's what Total War has been on the campaign map. You you could easily see settlements in 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 Rome one in medieval two in Empire and Napoleon and Shogun two you could easily distinguish settlements even in 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 Rome one uh, sorry Rome two but this is this is actually really nice I can see the map before I actually go into battle I I 
I like his feature. That's a re that's a positive inclusion to the map. So I'm the attacker. He's gonna have flat terrain. I'm a, I'm hoping this is accurate. I'm hoping this is accurate. That that would be really silly if they included this feature and it's not accurate. But you know, nothing is past CA at this point. Okay, so the terrain. Oh my God. So yeah, that 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 terrain map was completely inaccurate. I see. Whoa. Wow. Okay, so I take that back. Wait, wait. I, I take that back. Okay, I was praising that feature, but what what is the point if it's not even accurate? Is is it is it purposefully trying to trick you or something? Is this like some Chinese Sun Tzu thing where they're purposely trying to trick you? So how exactly did the two campaign modes differ in no meaningful way? Opting for record simply replaced a single entity heroes with bodyguard units on the battlefield. Bodyguard units that were still far too difficult to defeat and dominating in gameplay. Unit classes, balance, technology progression, diplomacy, the building system, and everything else would see no difference between the modes. It was nothing more than a poorly veiled attempt to entice CA's former disgruntled fans into believing they were finally being catered to after seven years of having been neglected. That or CA completely misunderstood those players' complaints, believing the criticisms of the Warhammer titles stemmed from the fantasy setting and not the game's design elements. Design elements that, I remind you, had their debut in Rome too, a game whose setting is as historical as they get. Three Kingdoms was a marketing piece first and a game second, a product that was being aimed at as wide an audience as possible. That audience including Warhammer players, a Chinese audience that CA was tapping into for the first time, and series veterans who had mostly departed following Rome 2's botched launch. In what should be a surprise to nobody, this drive to appeal to everyone ended up satisfying no one. But we won't go over that just yet. Knowing the extreme defensiveness fans of the newer games have to criticism, it's time to delve into the arguments in defense of the series' current direction. If you're one of these people, I'd be surprised if you even hung around to reach this point in the video, but let's do this anyway for the record. These games aren't bad, that's just your opinion. Do you think formations being reduced from physical simulations to arbitrary stat buffs or its effects on gameplay are my opinion? Do you look at how the studio on Three Kingdoms is an impenetrable mobile fortress and think, yeah, that's more engaging and more interesting than the considerations for positioning, direction, and time to form or dissolve the formation that had to be made in Rome Total War in 2004. There are many more examples that I'll go over very shortly. You're nitpicking. That there are more than a few earth-shattering design decisions in these games is undeniable considering the evidence given in this video so far. To name a few, the requirement for armies to be led by generals, restricting players' ability to coordinate a variety of forces on different fronts while hampering territorial defense of large late-game empires, and secondly, the absurd difficulty modifiers rendering a large portion of the roster ineffective. The point about difficulty modifiers receives quite a lot of pushback in particular, with the response being that you simply don't have to play the game on higher difficulties. I know what you're saying. You're so smart. Assuming I wasn't aware of that option, what is the point of even featuring harder difficulties if all turning up the difficulty slider does is punish me for using basic military strategies centered around a dependable infantry line? You may as well have removed the option to choose difficulty entirely and left the tuning for normal difficulty as the standard. The whole purpose of higher difficulties is to challenge players to leverage all of the in-game mechanics as best as they can to overcome bad odds. Not to reduce the number of viable and interesting strategies and tactics at their disposal. If you're still unsure about my explanation, I'll use an example of a game that properly implements difficulty. Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare. Increasing the difficulty in that game did two things. It reduced your character's hit points while increasing the number of grenades thrown your way. What effect did these elements have on gameplay? You couldn't run around recklessly or you'd get shot to death. But at the same time, grenades would prevent you from holding up in one spot forever. It forced you to balance movement versus cover, constantly being aware of your surroundings and enemy positions. And that's it. It's dead simple, but the result is a game that pushes you to do your best and feels rewarding to play and master. You don't even need to go to a different genre or franchise to see a proper implementation of difficulty. This was something past Total War games already did. Medieval 2 gave melee bonuses to enemy units, but they were so slight they would only become apparent after repeated controlled tests. In a realistic gameplay scenario, you would ensure your units had every advantage possible, from the high ground to protected flanks, more than making up for the AI's stat buffs. In Shogun 2, units didn't receive any buffs to their melee or morale whatsoever, though ranged units gained noticeable accuracy and reload skill buffs. 
which was problematic in certain situations, especially in open terrain, but it wasn't nearly as damaging to the battle gameplay as the modifiers in Rome 2 or everything that followed. And when your defense against an argument is that you're nitpicking, that implies nitpicks don't count as issues, when they are still worth bringing up no matter how insignificant you think they are. Whether or not something is a nitpick can vary widely from person to person, so this point is utterly worthless. One man's nitpick could be another man's deal breaker. The strangest part about this is you'll almost never be told you're nitpicking when you praise minor positive elements in the game. If you're going to respond to a supposedly minor point by saying you're nitpicking, you better apply this judgment consistently. CA is only making these games the way they are because the fans clearly enjoy them. Except CA has had more blunders than successes after Medieval 2. Since 2009, there's only been one good fully-fledged Total War game, or two if you can't follow the Samurai as it's basically a full game priced as an expansion. Empire's release was a mess, the game is still unfinished, Rome 2 broke pre-order records but nearly killed the franchise, Thrones of Britannia bombed and was subsequently abandoned, Three Kingdoms was abandoned with planned DLCs being cancelled, Rome Remastered was released less than a year ago as of the making of this video, and yet it has lower player counts than the original version could muster as of April 2021. And finally, Troy was released on Steam just a few months ago to no fanfare. CA's only financial successes since 2013, being Three Kingdoms' initial sales records and the commercial success of Warhammer 1 and 2, are outnumbered by a list of failures. Given all this data, how could you possibly suggest that these games are fine as is because their players like them, when said player base barely exists outside of Warhammer 2 currently? And you can be sure that Warhammer 2 is not going to see any activity the moment 3 drops. If Troy, your most recent title's player counts are dwarfed by games that are nearing a decade old, then consider your business model might have a few problems. If you don't like a game, don't buy it. Yes, I haven't bought any Total War games after Attila aside from Three Kingdoms. Regardless of that, this argument is nothing more than a diversion from the issue at hand, that the series has regressed severely in quality of both its core mechanics and production values after the highs achieved by 2012. As a company, CA is in the business of making money. You can't fault them for doing something if it makes them money. Believe it or not, this statement does have some validity to it. It would be silly to suggest that the company act in a way that makes it less profitable. But as I've already demonstrated, CA's portfolio stretching back to 2013 has more commercial failures than successes. If making money is their goal, they're doing a bad job of it. I also can't help but ask why you are even bringing up this point in defense. Unless you're an investor or someone on CA's payroll, I cannot understand for the life of me why their profitability should be of any concern in this discussion. Sure, there are problems in the newer titles, but to be honest, all Total War games had their problems. Let's go through the definition of whataboutism. The technique or practice of responding to an accusation or a difficult question by making a counter accusation or raising a different issue. Nowhere in this video have I ever explicitly or implicitly stated that older Total War games are flawless. Even the pinnacle of the series gameplay Shogun 2 had its fair share of bugs and cut features. Don't believe me? If you have the game, load it up right now and try not pulling your hair out in a large scale siege defense as units take forever to respond to orders. That it stands as the best entry in the series in spite of these glaring flaws is downright embarrassing. In 2022, the idea of going back to Shogun 2 or Medieval 2 should be an absolute joke, but here we are. Once upon a time, sequels were made with the expectation that they would improve on what their predecessors had achieved. New modes, balance improvements, more robust simulation, a refined UI, better graphics. Now the most engaging part of any new Total War title is finding out what features they decided to cut this time. You don't go looking for historical features in a fantasy Total War game like Warhammer. First of all, have more respect for fantasy as a genre. Lord of the Rings isn't a great story because it has cool monsters and random events occurring without any rhyme or reason. The story and world are brought to life by the characters, their stories, their actions, their perseverance in the face of impossible odds. None of this would have had any meaning without established rules and consistency within the world itself. Would it be better if Frodo could suddenly call in a tactical magical airstrike to destroy the armies of Mordor? You also may have forgotten one of the most popular mods in the franchise's history is the Lord of the Rings mod for Medieval 2. The setting is not the issue at hand, because setting in and of itself adds no value to media beyond a person's subjective preferences. This blatant misconception that the fantasy genre of gaming is one where corner cutting and poorly conceived features are perfectly acceptable is horrifying. And as long as it exists, we can't reasonably expect the Total War games to ever be good again, since Warhammer's success has made it the blueprint for all other titles going forward.
Now I'm going to stop going through these counter arguments to point out a theme that you may have already noticed. The tendency to sidestep or outright deny that these games have indeed seen a decline in quality. Someone might tell me that this is just all my point of view, and that's why I've compiled a list of all the features that have been removed throughout the series history. The ability to move units on the campaign map individually. The ability to field as many armies as the player's funds and infrastructure would allow. Population. Rooms in Empire and brought back in a simplified version in Three Kingdoms. Population in Three Kingdoms is no longer directly tied to recruitment, whereas in Rome 1, a 120-man unit would logically decrease the population of a settlement by 120. Disease, which has gone from being a more dynamic element of gameplay to modifiers tied to random events occurring in random provinces. Unlimited building slots, removed in Empire. All provinces being equally upgradable, removed in Rome 2. The distinction between towns and castles, seen only in Medieval 2. The three-way option list of occupation, sacking, and extermination when capturing a settlement, last seen in Medieval 2. And brought back in a simplified version in Three Kingdoms. More complex political systems, such as the papal mechanics of Medieval 2 and Senate for Roman factions in Rome 1. Naval battles. The ability to name and customize units in multiplayer, seen in Shogun 2's Avatar Conquest and Never Again. Multiplayer, which Troy launched without, following years of the mode being increasingly neglected and dumbed down. Yes, I know they eventually added it back to Troy, but you don't get points for adding something months after release when every game prior launched with it. The General Camera, which locked players' perspective to that of the army's leader in battle, seen in Rome 1 and Medieval 2. Dynamic unit experience. In older titles, a unit could regress in experience if it lost men faster than it killed enemy soldiers. This meant committing your more experienced units to battle was a dilemma. In newer games, units can no longer regress from their current experience level, so there's no reason you shouldn't use your veteran units so long as you don't completely lose the regiment. Dynamic character development, traits, and retainers, at its best in Rome 1 and Medieval 2, later dumbed down in Empire and only partially restored in Shogun 2, before again being neglected in favor of stat modifiers, and, with the release of Warhammer, overpowered single entity characters. Loose formation. Removed in Rome 2 but brought back for some units in the patch and it continues to be absent in Warhammer and Three Kingdoms. Guard mode. Removed in Rome 2 but brought back in a patch. Again, the fact that it wasn't even in the release build earns it a spot on this list. Fire at will. Also removed in Rome 2 before being patched in. Key bindable unit abilities and formations. A clickable faction icon on the battle UI which highlighted the player's units and enemy units so as to distinguish them. Firing drills for firearm equipped units such as Neil Fire and Fire by Rank introduced in the original Shogun and last seen in Follow the Samurai. Reloading animations for firearm equipped units last seen in Follow the Samurai. Dynamically simulated formations replaced by arbitrary and overly simplistic stat modifiers. Agent cinematics. Cinematics for important events like the Mongol invasions in Medieval 2 and Realm Divide in Shogun 2. Realm Divide, only seen in Shogun 2 and its expansions. Light infantry units having the unique ability to swim through deep water, seen in Rome 1. Dismountable cavalry, not present in the Warhammer titles. Because cavalry can't be dismounted, Horses can no longer be scared away so as to leave the unit on foot for the rest of the battle. Single unit control groups, last seen in the release build of Shogun 2 before being curiously patched out. Units fighting to the death when completely surrounded in field battles. The ability to retrain units to provide them with upgrades from a province, last seen in Medieval 2. Watchtowers, necessary for improving visibility on the campaign map, last seen in Medieval 2. Forts that could be occupied on the campaign map, separate from settlements. Seen in Empire and Napoleon. Trade theaters and nodes, introduced in Empire and last seen in Shogun 2. Campaign map buildings that were separate from settlements, introduced in Empire and last seen in Follow the Samurai. The ability to trade provinces with the AI. Though to be fair this was far too abusable and in the short term its removal was a good thing. However, the AI should have been made more competent over the years so as to make this feature's inclusion a positive one. General speeches, which were removed in Empire, returned in Shogun 2 but didn't return and follow the samurai and have since been absent. Outside of short, uninspired speeches in Rome 2 that didn't even have any camera work or accompanying music. Three Kingdoms has characters banter with one another in battle, but the dialogue is comprised entirely of generic one-liners that are anything but pleasing to listen to. Unit introduction movies, seen only in Shogun 2's Sengoku campaign and never again. Matched combat animations, first introduced in Medieval 2 and last appearing in Attila. Starting with the first Warhammer game, units simply go through preset animations irrespective of the size, shape, and weapon of their opponent. Whereas in Shogun 2, Spear Infantry had specific animations that they only used on cavalry, for example, units in current Total War games can be seen striking vaguely in the direction of their enemies, with hits frequently going wide but still registering and vice versa. I'll go on a bit of a tangent and say there is a common counter-argument that due to the sheer number of races and so-called variety of unit types in the Warhammer titles, it would be unrealistic to implement matched combat animations. 
This argument falls flat when you consider that most entities are still humanoid and could thus very reasonably share their animations, and especially when you realize that they had already done their motion capture work for past titles. They could have simply reused the animations that Katana Samurai had in Shogun 2 for all sword wielding units and would have been perfectly fine. Every Total War game in the past decade has copy pasted and reused assets from the previous entry so why not reuse the actually good parts? Tangent over. Different unit types being more or less effective in certain climates last seen in Napoleon. Elevation dynamically affecting projectile range. Absent starting with Empire. Combined land and naval battles seen in Rome 2 and Attila. Armor upgrades changing units appearance on the battlefield last seen in Medieval 2. The ability to set tax rates per province. Guilds that would give faction wide bonuses seen in Medieval 2. This would make a partial return in Shogun 2, where the first faction to build the highest tier of a building gained a permanent bonus. Free for all multiplayer battles featured only in Rome 1. The ability to tour your own settlements at the click of a button on the campaign map seen in Rome 1. Building upgrades being visible on siege maps, last seen in Medieval 2. Being able to approach forts from all four sides on siege maps, not present in the Warhammer titles. Whew. Okay, that was a ride. 50. Yes. 50 features that have been removed at some point, many permanently. Evidence for the series decline in quality doesn't get much more objective than that, and I wouldn't be surprised if you could expand that list to 70 or more. <laughs> This short segment of the video was by far the most time consuming one to make, and I had to stop the count lest I never release the video because Warhammer 3 dropped in to expand the list. It's safe to say that the series has not been on a good trajectory since 2013, not even commercially as I've already explained, and there aren't any signs of that changing anytime soon. And I'm not the only one who has little faith in this franchise. CA doesn't seem to respect it either, not even in a purely business sense. In early 2021, Rome Remastered was suddenly announced with barely a month till its release, and beyond that CA barely marketed the game. In fact, the Horsham studio which had worked on the classic wasn't even working on it, with that responsibility being shoveled onto Feral Interactive, whom until that point had done the Mac and Linux ports of older Total War games, Medieval 2 and Shogun 2 being among them. On top of Feral being woefully unfit for such a task, as you may have already guessed, that decision showcased how little respect CA has for one of their most revered titles that was unlike anything the strategy genre had seen until then. The game released with no significant gameplay additions outside of a promise for improved map modability, also quickly proven to be false, and even saw regressions in other aspects, like the sound design, visual effects, and especially the user interface. The campaign map icons were far too small, and the support for keybinds was reduced from the original. They didn't even have the courtesy to fix the miserably sluggish battle interface, the one problem that damaged the original the most. The so-called remaster failed at everything a remaster is supposed to do, and worst of all, it's no longer possible to buy the superior original as both versions are now bundled. But thankfully, I can still move units independently on the campaign app so I can confidently declare Total War, Rome Remastered the best Total War game since 2013, which says a lot about the franchise's current state. Barely a month following the remaster's release, CA announced they were ending support for Three Kingdoms, cancelling promised DLCs. While the game had had a strong release, it didn't have long legs, in part thanks to CA's curious choices for DLC, such as the Yellow Turban DLC set just a few years before the original campaign, and the Eight Princes DLC, which covered a time period controversial to some Chinese. I've also heard the suggestion that Chinese players aren't exactly big on paid post-release content, but I can't verify that. Either way, the game failed to create a substantial long-term player base, and Warhammer players aren't known for being fond of non-Warhammer Total War games. Even though Three Kingdoms shares much of its design with the Warhammer titles, Later in 2021, with its Epic Games exclusivity expiring, Troy was re-released on Steam to little fanfare, seeing lower player counts than games that had been released a decade or more earlier. In response, CA gave us the Mythos update, which added more fantastical elements to the game in an attempt to entice their main audience, Warhammer players, into buying the game. Doesn't seem to have worked though. Oh, and uh, two of CA's community managers announced they're leaving the company just a few months apart from each other. We won't ever know why, but regardless, it's not a good showing ahead of a release as major as Warhammer 3, which CA probably needs to perform well commercially after four consecutive failures. Oh, and uh, Thrones of Britannia was a thing. Don't get angry at me, CA forgot about it too. So where is this franchise headed, especially with a major release around the corner? Given how lucrative the Warhammer IP has been for CA, combined with every non-Warhammer title in the past five years ending up as an abandoned financial failure, 
I don't think the third title in this trilogy will be anything other than profitable. But gameplay-wise, marketing should always be taken with a grain of salt, especially with all of the high-profile botched buggy releases that have become the norm of the gaming industry. But whereas infamous titles like Fallout 76, Anthem, and Cyberpunk 2077 had high budget and concerted marketing campaigns, the same can't be said for Warhammer 3's promotional material. I'll play a few clips and pay attention closely. Sieging a settlement should not be an easy undertaking. Total War Warhammer 3 has reworked how sieges work. With new ways of attacking as well as defending, every inch taken will cost dearly. Settlement maps are now larger, and we've introduced more variety of maps than in previous games. With the fall, we now have the option to turn the streets into a bloody maze. So those units are effectively not contributing to the fight at all. We have the ability to attack to defeat the melee units first. The might of Grand Cathay isn't enough to keep Siege from breaching the walls. The walls will soon fall. It's time to fall back to our secondary positions within the city. Our defense now lies with our barricades, traps, and towers. We'll need a new currency introduced in Warhammer 3, supplies. We'll start the defense with a base number of supplies and can gain more during combat by holding locations around the settlement. Minor supply, key building, and victory points. These key points have pre-designated build locations. Pre-designated build locations. Pre-designated. Pre-designated. Pre-designated build locations for construction. Once a barricade or tower, it's worth noting that whilst attackers can capture points, they cannot build barricades or towers. Rather than a messy brawl in the streets, Warhammer 3's sieges are about defenders controlling the flow of battle. So those units are effectively not contributing to the fight at all. We have the ability to attack to... They allow for a multi-layered experience where units can be docked to overlooks and walls within the settlement itself. So those units are effectively not contributing to the fight at all. We have the ability to attack to and encourages real-time reorganizing of defenses to adapt to an ever-changing battle. So those units are effectively not contributing to the fight at all. We have the ability to attack, to... And phenomenal visuals. And phenomenal visuals. The Dragon Emperor is safe for now. Even so, his daughter has barely managed to escape with her life. To Nangao she travels. The Great Bastion, more than a wall, a symbol of everlasting defiance, is besieged. Demon armies in service to Tsinch, the Changer of Ways, have amassed at the Snake Gate, the Turtle Gate, and the Dragon Gate. Miao Ying, the Storm Dragon, defender of the Northern Provinces, master of the Storm Winds, and supreme matriarch of Nangao, rides with her army to once again drive back the Chaos God. God's advances. The Snake Gate, one of three heavily fortified gateways bridging Grand Cathay and the Chaos. Best to face these demons head on in a fortress built for defense. Fortress built for defense. Fortress built for defense. Fortress built for defense. Chaos will find every inch of every street hard fought and shielded every step of the way. Miao Ying is the firstborn of the Celestial Dragon Emperor and commander of the Great Bastion. She is the Storm Dragon and expertly wields the law of Yin to both smite her foes and grant boons to her soldiers. So in tune with the winds of magic are Cathay's wizard kind that the mere presence of another user bolsters magical potency. This elemental mastery rings true for two wizards as it does for ten, making Cathay's magical prowess a thing of deadly wonderment. Fate Weaver emerged with two heads. The left scries the past, while the right foresees the future. Thus, the Oracle of Tsinch sees both the road ahead and the path behind, but is rendered blind to the present. 
The demons of Tsinch march forward, their legions unfathomable as they shape. But given the fortress walls to hunker behind, Cathay has the rare advantage in a toe-to-toe -to -toe ranged standoff this day. With little other choice, she calls upon her greatest of powers and transforms into her namesake, assuming her dragon form. With little other choice, she calls upon her greatest of powers and transforms into her namesake, assuming her dragon form. If you hadn't noticed yet, there's a distinct lack of close combat on display. Of course, visuals should serve the gameplay and are meaningless on their own. But one of the most marketable aspects of Total War has been its battles, it's featuring thousands of individually rendered and animated models. It's a scale that very few games as a whole can even come close to matching, and it's something that can be easily marketed to both casual-minded players and RTT enthusiasts. And yet nowhere in this game's promotional material is any emphasis drawn to what should be an easy home run for marketing. Almost every time lines clash and the action intensifies, the camera cuts away, usually shifting the attention to the superpowered characters, never in any believable danger while the common man, or monster, is fighting intensely for what they believe in. And as the visual aspect fails to create any investment in the viewer, more of their attention is drawn to just how bad the voiceover is, with sentences either stating the obvious or not making any sense to begin with, on top of the Hollywood-style dramatic tone of the narrator just not fitting in with the low-impact cinematography. The impression I'm left with is that CA has little confidence in the quality of the games they're making. The variety and detail and animations have declined so severely that even the people putting together these pieces are not proud of what they have to show. That what was once the biggest unique selling point of this franchise is being consistently buried is enough to tell you how badly Total War has been mismanaged. Not just from a gameplay standpoint, but from a marketing and business one as well. If Warhammer is making CA a lot of money, just imagine how much more they could be making if they tried selling epic battles with the effects of terrain, morale, unit mass, all being intuitive and realistic to a much wider audience. Instead, CA has worked itself into a corner where attaching the Warhammer IP to a product is the only way to make it commercially viable. Their fate is tied to a single IP, a terrible prospect for not just a game developer, but any company. A single IP that doesn't even belong to them. Hey there guys, thank you so much for watching. It's been a lot of work to get this video, to put this video together from script writing to recording to general research to revising and it's finally done. First of all, I just uh, I just want to apologize in case I didn't cover any of the points that you were hoping me to cover or not or you hoped I would cover in more detail but at a certain point, I had to cut everything short and just upload the video because I would. It, it just kept on. It kept on getting longer and longer and longer and more bloated. So here it is. Thank you so much for watching, guys. Uh, the, I appreciate it if you liked, commented, and subscribed. If you're new to the channel, I, I do a lot of Shogun 2 videos and more general gameplay and let's plays. Hop onto Discord, join in all the gaming related and non gaming related discussions, you name it, we talk about it. I'd also like to extend my thanks to folks over on, on Arvaland for helping me put together, helping me scrape together some information for this uh, video, research purposes. And if you want to support the channel further, you can hop onto Patreon, gain access to exclusive videos extended cuts you can also check out some of the behind the scenes footage for this documentary all of my unabridged footage recording sessions for all the different games you can check that out on patreon i definitely appreciate the support over there you can also check out the merch store get access to your own branded channel merch bottles caps beanies more to come hopefully thank you so much for watching guys and i will hopefully see you next time Bye bye